right, well, there has been much said about misogyny and the hard time that women get in public life. And indeed, the current beatification, the elevation of Jacinda Ardern to martyr status has largely been built on this narrative that we explored a bit yesterday. And I think we established pretty clearly that these uh, academic studies uh, don't really hold water. Um, it's really hard... Oh, well, A, if you're going to go to the dark corners of the internet, of course you're going to find nasty things said about people, very nasty things, way nastier than on Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else. And also, just being Prime Minister means you get a lot of heat. Um, so I thought we'd talk to another female politician about whether or not she gets a hard time because of her gender in politics. And we are joined by ex-Deputy Leader Brooke Van Velden. Uh, Brooke, lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Oh. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Have you been subject to misogynistic comments or anti-woman comments or, or criticisms of you based on gender since you became a politician? Oh, look, I think to a certain extent, I'm sure but it's not the only comments. Um, you know, there are some comments that might be about gender. There might be some comments about, you know, whether or not I should go back to the country that I came from. Very strange comments. What that country do you come from? It, I was born in New Zealand. You get some oh, strange okay. comments. But the point is, there are weird comments that are made online every day um, and they don't necessarily mean anything. Uh, but it's so easy to write a comment online uh, without actually thinking through whether or not um, it will be a, a form of abuse. But I do think there is another question there about whether there is misogyny in general uh, to female politicians. I don't believe I've been subject to the same uh, misogyny that some other female politicians do. And, you know, that's in sexualized comments, um, abuses that might be about rape threats. Those are mm. things that I haven't received, thankfully. But other female politicians do. There is another question there, though, about whether that was the reason for the Prime Minister stepping down. And I don't believe that was the case. You know, Jacinda has had a lot of abuse online, um, but she was asked point blank whether or not that actually factored into any decision for her stepping down. And she said it didn't. Now, if you're someone who wants to stamp out misogyny and you want females to be part of Parliament, uh, you've also got to take them at their word um, and not ignore what they've said. And it is a form of misogyny from the people who are woke and saying that she's stepping down because of misogyny, not to listen to her and actively ignore what she has said. And she has it's said like that misogyny was not the reason yeah. for stepping down. It's like we're mansplaining misogyny to her, isn't it? Well, exactly. You know, it's actually demeaning and diminishing of the Prime Minister to ignore what she has said, which is that no misogyny was the reason for her stepping down, and to go out and put all of these opinion pieces out there as though it is fact. Yeah, but that surely she Alison out. Moore and, and Verity Johnson and all these feminazi writers, they know, they know the truth better than the Prime Minister, and they're women. It's not like that she's been mansplained to. We've had huge amounts of the mainstream media, we've had academics doing studies on this and explaining why it, it, it's misogyny. How can all those people be wrong, Brooke? Oh, quite easily, because they're not actually living the life of a female politician. Um, but, you know, I do take other politicians at their word, and they do get a lot of abuse. It's not just the female politicians, though. You know, you actively think in the last few years of who were the politicians that have seen the most flack, well, James Shaw would have to be up there for actually having been abused yeah. uh, on his way to work. And I, I believe he had a broken eye socket. And yeah, that is yeah, not it was okay. pretty nasty, that, that, that assault. It was, it was a deep. pretty nasty attack. Uh, but we have to stamp out abuse wherever it's occurring. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of people, um, you know, when they're on their way to work, feeling unsafe on the streets. Uh, we're seeing people being attacked even with, when they're just doing their jobs in society at the dairy. Um, there is abuse out there. It's not just directed at politicians. I think just from having a public platform, uh, people do get a form of abuse uh, that other people might not. Uh, but that's not to say it's at a level that's meaning people were not willing to stand for parliament. And when that is put out there in the media as Jacinda's reason 
uh, for when she said down. it's not. I, I think that is a form of misogyny. Yeah, uh, Brooke, you also have to accept, and I guess in more innocent times, before the age of the internet and Twitter and all the other stuff that I can't keep up with anymore. You kind of accept it if you're a politician. I can remember at school at Nelson College, what was his name, Rudy? Um, Rudy through a uh, young guys at school with, Rob Muldoon came to Nelson College, this is how old I am. And this guy uh, in my year threw, teed up and threw eggs at him. He egged Rob Muldoon. Big scandal. But at the end of the day, yep. I think politicians expected occasionally. It was huge news when someone threw a tomato or an egg at someone. A kind of legitimate parameter for expressing political, you know, dissatisfaction w w with a politician. Is the internet anything more now and nasty comments on Twitter or anything? Is that anything more than the modern equivalent of chucking an egg or a tomato? I think it's interesting, you know, to 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 have people elected to parliament means that we're electing a small group of people who'll be making decisions about how other people can go about living their lives. So there is always going to be a tension between uh, laws that are being made and the effect that they'll have on people. And there will be an emotional impact. You know, you think of in the last five years, how many divisive policies have been put in place by Labour uh, when it came to things like vaccine mandates, um, you think about the gun buyback and the vilification of firearm owners. Um, you think about landlords and the taxes that have been imposed on them. There's been a lot of othering. Uh, and of course that will come with emotion and people wanting to, to say their piece. Uh, the difference I think that we've seen over the last few years is in the past when people needed to uh, talk to a politician, they'd actually have to either physically ring them up mm -hmm. uh, or go to a public meeting. Or write a um, letter. The difference now... Which, and if you don't know, letter. Brooke, letters are things you put in letterboxes with stamps on them. You'd write them <laughs> out yourself physically and they would go to people, they'd open them up and read them. I just... You probably missed Yeah, that. but in the process of doing that, you're either becoming somebody who is going to go through with a threat in person, like throw an egg, or going through that process will calm down your emotions. Being online, you're able to just send whatever message you have right in the heat of the moment. I think that is the difference. But it happens to all people, not just politicians. And you know, not there are just a lot of women. young people online. Yeah, and not, and just, not women. just women. Yeah, it's I mean, I, I've had the wood take, a, take another example. Yeah. I've had the wood chip death threat a couple is, of um, times. David. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. Um, David Seymour. Um, over the years, I've seen the types of cartoons that have been published in newspapers, um, you know, calling him terrible, terrible names, um, not based on any fact or reality. Um, but you know, I think also the media do have a role to play in this. Uh, if we're wanting to talk about misogyny in female politicians from the same people that just went on breakfast TV yesterday uh, and had a doll of up. Trump yeah. and then used a salt gun to shoot the doll, we have to actively ask whether or not the media are being part of the problem. Because yeah. I thought that that was actually quite disgusting. Do you think that TVNZ needs to apologise for that? That Simon Power needs to stand up and say to those people on breakfast, not cool? I think he does. I think we do need to have a standard we expect of media uh, where if they're talking about wanting um, politicians to be safe or they're talking about people standing down because of abuse, they can't at the same time also actively go out there and sh show pictures of themselves shooting dolls of politicians. Yeah. I mean, that is just a double standard. But it was that Donald not Trump, Brooke, and most people, I think, think he's an a-hole. Sorry, I'm just being the, devil's the, advocate here. <laughs> no, that, that's true. There are many people who don't like Donald Trump. Um, there are lots of people who don't like Jacinda. Um, to, to have people actively shooting darts into people's faces or, uh, or mm. showing a doll being shot over can lead to yeah, and encouraging they actually encouraged other people to do it um who yeah, wouldn't have been exactly. okay to have as the doll i was suggesting maybe you would have got away with vladimir putin or adolf hitler that's yeah no i can see why there might be a scale to it but i think the media shouldn't be involved in that at all 
Yeah. You know, I, I expect better standards of our media. I want them to keep us informed, not tell us their opinions, but actually tell us the news and tell us the facts of what's happening. Why are you doing me out of a job? I love telling people my opinions. <laughs> but I also love eliciting opinions I don't agree with and exploring uh, opinions uh, I don't agree with. Look, the other thing, Brooke, so uh, look, and thank you for in some ways dispelling the myth. So you do not feel as a young woman, uh, young, uh, that's ageist, um, as a woman, you don't feel particularly put, a, put upon in a political context. You roll with no, these punches. No, I don't. Okay, that, that, is, that is fantastic. And I guess that might also be reflective of how uh, you play politics. Um, why do you think there is this obsessive narrative, despite the, um, the denials of the Prime Minister, uh, and she's still Prime Minister, why do you think this narrative has just been, for the last four or five days, just been repeated and repeated and repeated, largely by female columnists or woke columnists in, in mainstream media? Well, look, I think in some ways it, it paints into um, what people are trying to see through society and what a lot of politicians have been trying to do over the last few years, which is to paint people into being either a villain or a victim. Mm. Um, you know, you see it through the New Zealand curriculum. You see it through landlords versus renters, uh, people who have firearms versus people who don't. Um, the media and the Labor government have been obsessive about wanting to put people into boxes. And for whatever reason, um, they're wanting to put the Prime Minister into being a victim uh, when that is not the case. You know, she says actively that she doesn't want to be a victim and that's not her reason for stepping down. Uh, misogyny is not her reason for stepping down. But that doesn't fit into their narratives. So they've just ignored her and carried on with what they wanted to do anyway. Uh, that is just, quite frankly, a form of misogyny. Uh, and they should listen to the Prime Minister and take her at her word uh, for why she wanted to step mm. down. Do you think she should be, and we all know that politics gets bumpy and, and, and polarised, uh, do you think she should be left alone after today? She's not the Prime Minister anymore. That's uh, Chippy, Chris Hipkins' job. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I actually do believe that when politicians aren't in Parliament anymore, they should be allowed to go back to ordinary life. Um, but, of course, there's always going to be a difficulty with such a high profile and such high name recognition uh, that there are people who will probably go after her. Um, so I do understand the need for police protection. I believe that's been available to other um, former prime ministers, uh, but that's not to do with gender. That's to do with name profile uh, and having such a high target on one's back. Yeah. Hey, Brooke, if I could move on because I've got you here. You guys didn't go to Ratana y y yesterday. And I think uh, David said something that it's just a Labour loving anyway, so there was no upside for it. Um, and, of course, you missed out on, you know, the Jesus-like procession of, of Jacinda Ardern, um, which we had predicted yesterday morning on the show. Um, what did you think, what did you make of the two positions taken by the two Chris's? Um, Chris Luxon finally coming out and saying we don't agree with co-governance in the distribution of public resources, which I thought was a kind of get out of jail free card or a, a rider, and mm -hmm. we had um, we had the the prime minister designate uh, Chris Hipkins saying, "I don't think co governance is really well understood," but then he didn't explain what it was or what the Labor Party meant by it. All that to me seems to feed in to Axe's desire to actually have a meaningful debate on this issue. Yeah, we do need to have a discussion about it. You know, there there is a lot of uncertainty out there about um, the removal of democracy in New Zealand um, and this inability for us to openly talk about it because as soon as you talk about co-government, you're seen as racist. And I think that's wrong. We have to talk about how our institutions are managed uh, because that's for the benefit of all New Zealanders. If co-government isn't widely understood and if the Treaty of Waitangi principles are being put through all bits of legislation, uh, we have to actively talk about it. Um, I don't want to see us going down a route where we're changing what it means to be a New Zealander and not being able to talk about it. Uh, so we do need a referendum. Um, I think we need to make a clear line in the sand and say that we live in a multi-ethnic, modern, uh, liberal democracy. 
Um, there is no longer just Pakeha being the white settlers and Māori. Uh, we are a, a collective. Um, we need to understand what the treaty means in modern life. And I don't believe that it. it's what the uh, Wellington academics have been painting the picture as. Yeah. Um, and it would seem to me, uh, I'm interested in your impressions, is Chris Hipkins saying, once I explain it to you, you'll be cool with it. Therefore, I'm not going to change anything. And we highlighted recently the remarkable guidelines for media put out by New Zealand On Air, which argued that sovereignty was never ceded. And in fact, we need to create a separate Maori government and all media organisations should reflect this and how they report and how they hire and how they train people. Is it enough, to your mind, for Chris Hipkins to say, once we've had the debate, we'll win it and we'll just go on our merry way? Is it enough, enough for Luxon to say he doesn't agree with it? Or do we now actually... Because this didn't happen in the last two years, it's happened in the last 25. Do we need to go through our public institutions and get rid of this rubbish and get rid of these reports and get rid of this cultural attitude that I think the ACT Party argues uh, creates the ethnic ethno state? I think we have to have an open debate. I think what, what we have at the moment is uncertainty um, from members of the public about what is happening and what is changing in our institutions. Um, but it's... Oh, sorry. you're popular. Sorry that. <laughs> but it's coming from um, years of public service pushing through the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi into everything uh, without any New Zealanders actually having a say on what those principles are. Uh, people have looked at the historic document and said that's not enough. There are principles of the treaty that didn't exist in the Treaty of Waitangi that we'll now try and implement throughout the public service and throughout all of our agencies uh, and ministries. And I don't think that's okay. Uh, we need to have an active conversation about what we look like as a society rather ha than having it changed um, kind of by stealth rather than openly. Mm. Brooke, I thank you very much indeed for your time and your perspective not just as an ACT MP, but as, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, as a woman uh, politician. Um, right, you can say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope there was not too much mansplaining. I'm now being criticised for using the term mansplaining. I'm being told I'm a misandrist now. You just cannot win, <laughs> uh, can you? Uh, I'll leave you to take your call. Someone wants to get a hold of you. I thank you very much indeed for your time. That is Brooke Van Velden. and she is the Deputy Leader of ACT. Um, and she lives the life of a female politician. She says, all the pearl clutching by the Alison Moores and the Verity Johnsons in this world. Well, she says it's all bullshit, doesn't she?